for 40 years, they poisoned people knowingly because they paid some scientists to prove the outcomes they wanted, collecting untold sums of money. And do you know what corporations said when people started to get lead poisoning and becoming brain dead or dying? They said the moms didn't do enough housework or dust enough and they're bad moms and they should make their kids wash their hands more oh. because they're gross because they're black. Is there anything more sinister than blaming a mother for their, for their sick child? I mean, that's some sinister. No. Oh, you want to, you want to No, Yeah, there is. I'm glad you asked. Cause I actually have an answer. There is, there is something more sinister. It's oh, jeez. Said you had a bit for Austin. I had a bit for Austin because right. when, when I'm thinking about these things, I always try to think of a comedic idea. And uh because I'm a fake comedian. So <laughs> I don't you, know. I've I've lived I've been listening to a few of your songs and uh you get some good lines in there, man. You get some good one liners. I just I'm like, help, like punching it up, right? <laughs> no, I don't know. There's some I'm like, that's uh yeah. you want to see a dead body? Or, <laughs> yeah. So or what's the so the bit is, um, if you remember, it's based on this idea. Uh, do you recall Operation Warp Speed? That was the Trump idea and all these these people that were in charge of Operation Warp Speed, which was to get the vaccine as quick as possible, right? Mm -hmm. So this is Warp Speed. It was, it's completely against pretty much everything that they had laid out, the plans for you know, pandemics, so one of the big first planned everything, whatever I'm kind of stuttering on it was that you don't lock people down. And of course, politicians kind of pressured scientists into locking people down. And now scientists are kind of pointing the finger saying, well, it wasn't us. But yeah. um, <laughs> we had this Operation Warp Speed that that Trump loves to take credit for. And these these were a bunch of jokers that jumped in and kind of ignored everything and and we're we're saying we got this vaccine developing for forget the idea that the technology was developed in 2014 right so six years prior i don't know how, how fast a warp is but if you have something for six years i kind of don't think it's warp speed um also if if your product happens to be taxpayer funded and also, um, the federal government is mandating your product and running all of your advertising campaign for you. It doesn't sound like warp speed to me, but um, the bit the bits built on this idea. So we have this vaccine, this operation warp speed to get this COVID vaccine, right? They were charging Americans thousands of dollars per vaccine in other poor countries they would only charge people six dollars but you know american insurance racket also had to get their money yeah along with the you know 500 days of lockdown that created 500 billionaires a billionaire every day well you know we didn't do anything but sit at home get a little check but sorry the bit is we we warp speeded a few thousand dollar injection and and we felt really good about that could you imagine walking into a tat shop just to get a tattoo i don't know if you guys got any tattoos oh yeah walk into a tat shop and be like listen i need something warp speed <laughs> and the and then the tat guy's kind of looking at you like or speed, you know, don't you want me to do a good job? Or don't you want this stuff to be kind of, you know, if you're spending big money on this, you know, this is a $2,000 tattoo and you're just like, this is no, the whole back. This is I two need, tigers. I need it dogs. now. I need yeah. it. You know, I need it now. Warp speed. You know, and I was thinking there, are, there are a handful of things you, you don't want to cheap out or want speed on. <laughs> and we don't cheap out or want speed on tattoos, but we definitely wanted warp speed on a, uh, a shot that cost a couple grand and we just plug that right in there. You know, we don't even cheap out on tattoos and it's just <laughs> your skin. It's a picture of like, I love you, mom and dad. Yeah. But we, uh, we definitely cheaped out and overlooked that warp speed on that blaster shot. Right. I thought that I was do like that. <laughs> yeah. I didn't frame it like you would. Cause you know, you're a comedian and I'm not, but you know, that, 
I thought that was that was a pretty funny idea. That yeah, is a no, funny I like idea. that premise. Yeah, it's because it is like just the name warp speed is absurd. The, the names they give like warp speed inject as many people as possible <laughs> with this uh, six year old tech. Yeah, six year old. kind of, and they were like, this is a miracle. And it's like, well, if it was a miracle, it was a miracle in 2014 when it was made. It's <laughs> not a miracle in 2020. See, and why didn't they tell people like, all right, we, you know, we've been working on this since 2014. I bet people would have been like, all right, there's been some years behind this, but then they'd be like, why are they working on it? Yeah. But at the same time, I mean, it was framed as we just invented this in a back room at the White House. Warp speed it. Well, I don't think it would be that hard to explain to people that COVID-19 was called 19 because it was a strand of COVID. COVID's been around for a while. So, I mean, if you tell someone, I think the analogy I've heard, and I could be wrong on this, is it's kind of like the flu where, uh, you know, every year the flu strand hits a little bit different. And so when you if, if you get a flu shot, it's not there's so many different types of the flu that you're basically getting a shot of what they believe will be the most prominent strand of flu that year. That's, that's how a friend of mine is a paramedic explained it to me. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, we, we don't want to get demonetized. You know, we need that 48 cents that we're going to get for this conversation. So we can, we can just keep it moving. Good thinking. Yeah. We do need that 48 cents. So this, um, yeah, we'll get, we'll get a dime each and then we'll give the cat a dime. It yeah. seems it seems like a really long time ago. You know, no one talks about it anymore. You hardly ever hear it brought up. You know, it's like just reflecting on the fact that we lived through that insanity. Yeah, it only closed a ton of businesses and restaurants and people killed themselves and will continue to kill themselves because yeah. everything that they worked for in their life got taken away. But anyway, yeah, I mean, it's cool because we can work remote sometimes more now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's people like that lost everything, like that wanted COVID. Like, why didn't I get COVID? Kill me, please. Yeah, it was that that was a rough go, man. And I think it didn't age very well. Uh, I was open minded at the beginning wondering what this was i didn't another thing that's pretty annoying is when something happened everyone was like no 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 no, this is fake i'm like well it's weird because in the beginning it was like nancy pelosi was saying it was fake she went to chinatown and was hanging out and then i remember on guncast even listening to it and being like yeah david's got a good point because you're like people are saying well it's only a mild version of the flu and you're like i still don't want a mild version of the flu (laughs) like who wants to be sick (laughs) right well yeah so I I just didn't like the idea that everyone jumped to one conclusion or the other. Like, yeah, this is a mild version of the flu, which it ended up being. But it doesn't matter if you were right at the time because, you know, we were about a week in and you probably didn't know that it was. You're just some, I mean, in my world, I know you didn't know it was because you're just some guy that dropped out of school and lives with his mom telling me about uh, <laughs> you know, viruses now, all of a sudden, you know, you got to yeah, yeah. And then I'm like, I'll watch your next video where you talk about the earth being flat. I love <laughs> those guys. Exactly. So just to hop back on, um, just kind of talk about another conversation that we're constantly stuck in, you know, we'll be stuck in that for a while, but I brought up about being stuck in the rut or the trap of, of communists or socialists or Marxist, wh- whatever variation or flavor you want to use and the capitalistic argument. So a good guy to helicopter around Naomi Klein does in her book uh, is Milton Freeman. He said he had a lot of influence and he said he was a preacher giving a Sunday sermon, which he was because his religious fanaticism for economics was similar to the ideologues. And he believed ep- economics was a science, although it's not, and it never has been, nor is he a scientist, because the term social science is an oxymoron. You know, it's it's not like physics, but when you make up a, a phrase like social science, you kind of convince everyone like archaeologists call themselves scientists yeah because social scientists they're like what two words go together that will sound like i'm important and smarter than everyone else and they 
they just grab social from this column and scientists from this one and put them together. And they're like, boom, it's kind of like when people say that they can use science to disprove God. And it's like, yeah, that's not actually really how science is supposed to work. But anyway, <laughs> science is uh, a process. It's not, um, yeah. You know, these types of things like physics and math, you know, this is science and it checks out and it's a hard science and it's stable. But I call that unfettered capitalism or religion because it rests on the ideological faith element. Like we believe there's a God or a creator, right? They believe, although they call themselves scientists and they love to talk about how there is no God, they also they also start with a, a premise that's not provable and it's a faith-based element. And that's that the free market is a perfectly scientific system and it runs flawlessly. And if there is a dysfunction within it, like unemployment or inflation or whatever it may be, that's because somewhere inside the perfect science, there's an imperfection or a distortion or an asymmetry. So does that sound familiar? Like when you come across an ultra liberal argument and you hear about socialism, you always hear about, yeah, it ends in genocide and societal collapse, but that's not real socialism. <laughs> Have you heard that before? Like they didn't of do course. it right. Oh yeah. A teenager will be talking about how um, Mao didn't do it right. So <laughs> Mao didn't do it right. Yeah. From a 14 year old is <laughs> like, let me tell you what Mao should have done. Wearing a, <laughs> wearing a, a Chi t-shirt. Got it. Yeah, exactly. A Cheeto. And then, so the point is you know, there's no scientific proof of, any of these claims about the great free market God that they all worship. There's no example of a perfect system in the real world. There never has been. So just like the like-minded fanatics of today that build all of their beliefs, kind of like what we were just talking about on computer models or loaded equations, they call the loaded equations proofs, which really just means they're playing with numbers until they fit into your theory or narrative or rather the theory or the narrative that your boss who's providing the funding for the research is paying you to prove is true. So these are the same computer models they use to push the, the climate initiatives, but we can also set that aside. So the models uh, of today, uh, you might've heard about them. They're referred to as the science, which usually just means a corporate sponsored opinion. Yes. But, yeah. Right. The corporations. I mean, that's what I, I read one time that popular science is, is basically corporations that can hire scientists that will prove their product or, you know, basically anything that is coming to market. And then they write an article in popular science saying that this is, you know, eggs are now bad. So liquid eggs are better, you know, just something stupid like that. Yeah. I'm going to, I, we as a channel and would do best to not get specific on this, but I will say in vague terms, there are things out there right now that we know are not, um, where scientific opinions are coming out about them that we know are not correct. And there are some scientists who are coming out and saying, I had my funding pulled. I had my research watered down. Um, they, they took what I did and they changed it. And you have people who will go along with a lot and scientists will go along with things that they know are not true because they get funding. And I get the hustle, dude. I mean, hey, you you want to keep living your life however you're living it. And if somebody says, I give you this much money, but this is really the end result I'm looking for, uh, you're going to find it. It's kind of like similar when people talk about, um, you know, 99 percent of scientists agree in global warming. But have you ever stopped to think about scientists of what, you know, are we talking about a guy who's a scientist and, um, you know, he, he's a scientist and like in her ear, I don't know. I mean, just the most random. I, science, I mean, I'm know? just thinking about how in every Marvel movie, the scientist goes insane. And now I know why it's because everybody wants a different result in pain. Yeah. So they just put a bunch of octopus tentacles on and destroy cities. So, I'm actually on the, the mad scientist side now. Yeah, th there yeah. you go. Yeah, maybe maybe the mad scientists are really the purists. But anyway, it's really strange. You hear uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson do this all the time. He conflates, um, what would that be, kind of science or the idea of using the scientific process or being a scientist or 
being a researcher, studier, he kind of lumps courage into that as if it's a given. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a scientist, so I'm going to um, not take funding from corporations to do my research. And at the same time, you have this double think where, on the other hand, all you hear scientists say is, I didn't have any clue about that. I just want to be in my lab doing my work because that's what I love. And it's just like, which one is it? You know? It, yeah, you need money to do like that. Neil deGrasse Tyson, he seems just like a figurehead. Like rolling He is. Like so is Einstein. Why is it that the... You know, the head scientist has unkept hair. Why, the, why is their hair always like crazy? Like they're so smart that they can't, they can't their even hair. comb their hair because they're so dialed into science. Yeah. Bill Nye is the same way. He was a figurehead where they, a, they, they took some douchebag engineer and ha- who's an actor. I mean, let's not even let's dude, not even dude, get on Bill the engineer was, path. He's an actor who he played a, a scientist. He for was a kids. stand up comedian. He was Bill Nye. The science guy was a stand up comedian. You can look up his sets online and he got the role. He got the gig as Bill Nye. And then they just, you know, it's like Screech from Saved by the Bell. I mean, he's dead now. God rest his soul. <laughs> um, I played the first gig with him. I chose it uh, when he got out of jail for stabbing a guy. Did you know that Screech stabbed a guy? Yeah. David? Yeah. 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 I, I did uh, the first show when he got out of the me and him have a interesting history but damn uh, yeah <laughs> dude uh, but the same thing he was like permanently screech you know like bill mm-hmm. nye just became the science guy you know they would play him for uh for us in school and everything but he's just a, he was a stand-up comic that got a gig yeah that's people would, keep that in mind yeah when they when they would wheel the card out in sixth grade and bill nye the science guy and then yeah. these idiots are 30 years old now and they're like oh i believe his opinion it's like dude he's an actor He's an actor. You know, you might as well, like, listen to Danny DeVito's opinion on stuff. <laughs> you know, Bill um, Nye is not a science guy. And I, I hate him. I hate still doing his thing. He's still he's I seen him on a flight. I just took a flight over to. I forgot where I was going, but Bill <laughs> Nye is still doing. Was he wearing a bow tie on the plane? He was no, no. He was on the the television. Oh, we, oh, we on the plane. Put uh, talking about climate change. Yeah, of course. So That's he's going scientific, but just to just to get scientific, I'll give you an example, so it doesn't sound like we're just a bunch of you know right wing conspiracy theorists, which we will most definitely be called. <laughs> um, just how science is actually used in in the in the marketplace. Yeah, let's not go political. Um, think about lead, right? Well, lead had a big impact on my city. And I started looking into this lead thing about years when they started, started poisoning people and killing, making kids mentally disabled. And I came across a bunch of people that have written about it, but, you know, we talked about ancient Rome a few weeks ago Vitruvius, the Roman architect, petitioned the government to not build with lead 2,500 years ago, right? Dang, I didn't know that. Here we are, early 1900s, let's just say, Jeez. building pipes, painting houses, throwing it in gas. We've always known it was poison. We, we always known this. And to go back to the former example about the tobacco industry, GM said leaded gasoline was a gift from God and patented it because they couldn't patent it otherwise, right? So they add leaded gasoline, they get a patent, right? It's a gift from God, lead. They funded scientific studies. That's study. their tagline. <laughs> it was a yeah. So they studied, they funded these scientific studies to prove it was safe for 40 years. And they published them in Popular Science, I'm sure. Exactly. For 40 years, they poisoned people knowingly because they paid some scientists to prove the outcomes they wanted, collecting untold sums of money. And do you know what corporations said when people started to get lead poisoning and becoming brain dead or dying? They said the moms didn't do enough housework or dust enough, and they're bad moms, and they should make their kids wash their hands more because they're gross, because they're black. Is there anything more sinister than blaming a mother for their for their sick child i mean that's some sinister no. oh shit you want it you want it, it, it no yeah there is i'm glad you asked because i actually have an answer there is 
there is something more sinister. It's oh, when geez. they blame the baby. So then, you know, when that didn't go over too well, they came out with a new campaign. They said the black kids had perverted appetites, so they couldn't help but put lead in their mouths because they were perverts. What? What year was this? This is like uh, the bats in the this is early 1900s. You know, they, and, they always blame it on the eating habits. Exactly. Well, that's not even real. I mean, that's absurd. Yeah, yeah. So they ran around waving their scientific proofs in newspapers and on television. And people did the bidding of the corporations for them just like they do today. So the point's not really about lead or, or whatever it may be, but it's this empire hopping from one grift to the next and how we, the people, usually pay for it and sit here on podcasts complaining while they're on to their next con. Right. So it's it's good to kind of point out these issues just to make people aware because most people don't know this, but think about the things that you're arguing for today that you really believe and just look back and see all of the, you know, cases where it was scientists saying this same thing. And this is kind of circles back to the, socialism or um, capitalism or whatever you want to call it idea uh, that we were just talking about was I think this is one of those things where we get stuck in these ruts uh, arguing uh, to no end you know abortions another one but um, for example Public schools will say, talk about socialism, a little bit of capitalism, then we'll talk about a little bit of disaster. Milton Freeman, for example, just to use him as a figurehead, because all most free market um, economists and champions kind of believe the same thing, or kind of based on what he um, came forward with. And he pan he'll panic about how a public school is a socialism. Right. Like today we fund public schools, government funded. Uh, that is a form of socialism, regardless if people want to argue about our system or not. But if a school is a private business that we still fund because they're granted vouchers and grants and subsidies while actually being a private company, i.e. operating for profit, he doesn't panic. So he thinks if someone's benefiting from owning the school, they'll run it much better. This is the kind of conservative uh, Republican argument, private business will run it much better as if people don't run shitty businesses into the ground all the time, just like <laughs> governments do. Um, so they have a problem with the socialist public school, but they don't have a problem collecting government subsidies and vouchers when they own uh, up schools. And that's somehow not, they don't have a problem with that socialism. Like he doesn't panic about the corporate stronghold on government, which is actually by definition fascism yeah and they're like we're not taking money these are coupons right so if his private business operates and uh, he doesn't have a problem with the loose restrictions and all the oh you know lack of government oversight that his private business operates you know because these businesses don't operate the way you and i businesses operate that's why when there's a a global pandemic we our business close and never reopen their businesses get subsidies. So it's it's the same way for the Marxists and the socialists, how they panic about how we need socialism or communism or, or Marxism or whatever their preferred religion is. Yeah. But they ignore the, the fact that it causes, all, just like capitalists ignore that unfettered capitalism and this disaster form of capitalism crashes, economies, closes businesses, does the things that we're pretty familiar with very recently. This, the Marxist or whatever you want to call them, you know, they admit that hundreds of millions of deaths are caused and genocides are caused, but they just say they didn't do it right. Just like Milton says, when an economy crashes or a recession happens, that they didn't do it right. That's that's what anyone says when you bring up their really. <laughs> so. And usually he says, and we hear this same argument today. He says they they had they should have stuck in there, hung in there, and did it longer. They you know markets crumble, small businesses shudder, inflation and unemployment's through the roof. They shrug with all the arrogance of an intellectual, and they say that wasn't true capitalism, which really means 
it isn't what I mean by my hypothetical theory of capitalism that will never be proven and has never been proven. And I can kind of point to a few things after the fact about why it didn't work. And even the the arguments they use today are that's the market self-correcting when you get a recession or uh, inflation right now. And have you ever heard of that by by Republicans when they say that's the market self-correcting? We right. Label right it but, but it's really just a people taking a crisis and using it as an opportunity. Like yeah, all the companies, they're like, hey, let's just hike our prices up, you know, 30, 100 percent and yeah, then blame they, it on uh, COVID. Like, they, it's just like a perfect time to just. They never lower their price. Like I, I'll buy into the fact of like, okay, I do, I do believe, you know, that as gas prices go up or whatever, that you do have to raise your cost. I'm not a complete idiot. However, I do think it's a little bit of bullshit when they never rate, they never lower their prices either. That's what gets me. That's just (laughs) that. That's what bothers me. The prices don't go down. The freedoms don't that they take that they suspend are never returned. And they are right in a way. It is the market self-correcting from their corruptions and their damage (laughs) that they've dealt to the market. Yeah. The market is trying to buck back against it, but, and then, you know, you have huge companies like I think Austin, we need to be a little bit suspicious of Matt here because, you know, his last name is Bechtel. That's (laughs) the biggest, that's one of the biggest defense contracting. Uh, I was hoping you guys would have figured that one out. Oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. I'm put yeah. here by the Bechtel company to try to figure out what the hell David's. Up I was to. wondering, I was wondering yesterday, I was trying to fall asleep. And then I was like, wait a second. Is, <laughs> is Matt entered my life as my handler? I constantly take pictures of Austin and he's wondering <laughs> what I'm doing. Exactly. <laughs> he told me he's got, cause I asked him what, you know, what nationality he was from. Cause I was pronouncing his name wrong yeah it, i had it well i had it spelled with an r in my phone and i just thought he like kept adding an l to it like that was just what it was he's like no you have it spelled wrong and then he's a kennedy he's got kennedy yeah i was about to say now david's really gonna trip out when he finds out that uh, on my dad's side i come from a lineage of kennedys and maybe i should say this maybe i shouldn't my great grandpa Worked on the A bomb. I don't know much details about that. None of the family ever did, but I do know that he rolled with uh, Eisenhower, FDR, and Truman a little bit back in the day. So I can't find anything historical on that. But so yeah, you guys yeah. would do would do good to be suspicious of me. Yeah, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to continue my suspicion because <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of things going on here. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna sneak up behind him before he leaves and cut his hair. <laughs> yeah. DNA. Send it. By the way, uh, my great grandpa passed away of uh, leukemia in the '80s, and supposedly everybody he worked with in the government died of leukemia on his team during the war, and the government uh, never paid a dime for it. And we see that uh, again today with uh, soldiers and such who are in who their whole unit, you know, will get cancer or will get a disease and the government refuses to pay for it. Actually, that's a good transition. Let's let's talk about war. War, what is it good for? Huh. Uh David, let's talk about how these guys profit off of uh off of war a little bit because we kind of covered how they 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 profit off of any anytime something bad happens. And again, just I, I'll say this actually before we transition. Um I'm not against a guy making some money. There was a guy that got arrested because he drove, he bought a ton of generators and then drove down to New Orleans and then he sold them. And this guy actually was doing good. Like he, he, he sold them for enough to cover his cost to drive down there, but he saw they ran out of generators and he went down and sold generators to people. And I think he got arrested for it. I'm not against that. I mean, if there is something bad that happens, they need resources and, you know, it, it can be a very charitable and a good thing to, sell things to people in need. Don't get me wrong. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about people who are, you know, like they want to bomb a community so they can rebuild it and make the money off of it. And, you know, when things go bad, it's like, let's uh, wait a second to step in until let's really see this disaster through before. I'm starting to think that Nero pioneered that. <laughs> yeah, it's burned down to everything. Maybe it like- should be Nero. Nero con would be better. But yeah, let's let's kind of roll into Nero's how it happens in the military. Trying to think of a way to say it because yeah, I'm in the same boat as you. I don't really have a position as far as 
you know what I think's right or wrong. It's not like I don't have beliefs. I do have them. Yeah. But there are things that are are blatantly wrong. Of course. Um, that seem disagreeable to all parties involved. For example, again, I'm I'm trying to the reason why I'm taking a second is because I'm trying to position this to where both sides can agree on it. Like Mitch McConnell, um, the robot, um, he said recently, um, don't worry about that 113 billion going to Ukraine because it's coming back to military contractors anyway. He said, did you, like my Mitch, did you like my Mitch McConnell impression? I was wondering, I thought you were having a stroke, <laughs> but uh, no, that was good. When you said his name, I did. Yeah. I didn't, that was actually pretty dark of me to do that. Cause I think he was just having a stroke when that happened. But so uh, basically they're just giving it to the, our military contractors. Yes. The, the, the point is both sides should be mad about this. You know, we should, because we're both, no matter what you are in the country you're paying for it and if you, if you are you know super liberal wanting to help ukrainians you're paying military contractors that's what you keep voting for those bills the that the war hawks keep putting forward you're not helping some ukrainian kid escape from you know the war you're paying halliburton or bechtel but the point is uh, Thank you, guys. You're conservative. You're you. You should be mad as well about you know funding that type of thing because you, you know 113 billion dollars is flowing. I guess I could see the point where they might be okay with that because the way McConnell sees it, which is why he says thinks it's okay to say it on television, is it's good for American businesses. And this is where the conflict kind of comes in. You know, for example, getting to the war topic, Rumsfeld was a secretary of defense while holding and chairing defense contractor companies, which was against the law. But do you know what the compromise was by the American government? He had to leave the room when they talked about something <laughs> concerning his financial interests. <laughs> like Hilarious. a little kid. Yes. Like the parents are talking. All right, get out. Go in the well, hallway. Killed it. You know, it's just like um uh, got a glass to the door. <laughs> yeah. Dick Cheney had 200,000 shares of Halliburton when he retired from his administration, which steered us right into the war that Halliburton received all the contracts for. So this is what this is the the war hustle. This, you know, you remember terms like homeland security or the war on drugs or the war on terror. Remember the great one, Islamo-fascism? We yeah. were fighting Islamic fascists with subcontract government subsidy funded private military corporations, which also meant using 9-11, our own money to increase surveillance on us at home and take away our rights and our freedoms that we yeah, have. That's the, the Patriot, Patriot Act, Act, baby. That's the big Patriot Act. And of course you can't, it's greatly named just like a lot of these things oh, yeah. are, you know, um, there's a lot of rebranding and they even updated the Patriot Act. But once again, you know, they, they had global cooling in the seventies. If you remember, that was a bad, that was a bad brand. So they changed it to global warming when it started to get really hot. Well, then it became cold. So they were like, well, it's climate change. Yes. So they just, they do this. And, and when the government gives these military contracts, they're blank checks that basically say, do whatever you see necessary, which usually means build a suburb overseas. So our troops are so comfortable. They stay for over 20 years because they have a Walmart at a KFC. And then the company comes back and says, this is what we did. And then they pay them. So just to put it into perspective, do you know how many U.S. soldiers were killed in Vietnam? This is, by the way, this was a 12-year war. This was about half of the you know the war in the middle east i'll i'm going to i'm going to give a very wide guess i'm going to um i know i've heard the stat before it i'm going to guess 1 it was trillion dollars i'm going to guess american soldiers deaths it was probably between 20 to 60,000 at most i'm going yeah, yeah. i was going to go with 50 yeah 58 Damn. so 58,000 in a 12 year war in in my opinion and you know i don't want any american troops to die by the way um 
that's not a war. Or what they, What about Iraq? You know, the nonstop, never-ending story that we were bombarded with for over two decades. Do you know how many Americans... Was were, it 13,000 that died in that? Like Less than five. Oh, really? Yeah, it cost three trillion. So just to put it in, into perspective, of course, a million Iraqis died. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about trying to kind of outline this grift basically where we don't go and occupy a place for 20 years so we can spread democracy you know if our plan worked you know the old saying i know it's simple and i'm a simpleton so you know the old saying may the best man win you know if our ideas were so profound and so great we wouldn't have to kill a million people to try to convince them that to use them <laughs> That's yeah. not how things work. Great ideas. You know, Buckminster Fuller had a great quote that said, you don't destroy an old system by fighting it. You destroy an old system or re by replacing it by, by making it irrelevant. Well, David, I was actually, I want to, I was thinking about going to eat lunch at Dairy Queen and I asked Austin and he said no. So I was actually going to kill him since he didn't like that idea. So you're saying that yeah. I should have to kill someone. That's, that's really what, that's really the logic here. They, oh, they, okay. they are <laughs> saying exactly that no country with a McDonald's. It's a, this is a socioeconomic theory, but by the way, the people that call themselves scientists, they say, you know, if you throw up a McDonald's in a Chase bank, this country's going to have something to, you know, live for and get rid of the, you know, that's whatever. what we want to live for. That's yeah, what exactly. they think of us. We want to live for KFC and, and McDonald's. But hold on, uh, dude, are they wrong though? Because all they're missing is an Apple store and they might have the formula. Like, they, I mean, think about it. Hey, they, uh, there's people in America, really that's what they live for. That, that's what, we, yeah. Well, that's why they do it because. That's what we live for. That's yeah. what we believe. And they actually believe, and I don't know if they actually believe these things. I kind of think they do. But on the other hand, I just think they're, you know, it's a hustle. Yeah. But this was a real idea that, that they pushed. And, and just to touch on what we talked about last time, this is a civilization literally older than Jesus. And they're saying, all we have to do is throw up a McDonald's. It, it reminds me of what we started talking about when we were talking about the Asian and what they eat in the wet market and all that stuff, right? Yeah. We were just, it's it's just a big diss. Most, even when you're not trying to help the disenfranchised or these people that clearly need you to run to their rescue, which they never do usually, <laughs> when you're not trying to help them, you're still dissing them. You know, even if you're coming from a liberal perspective where you're like, you know, I want to help the world and save the world. A lot of these, you know, middle-aged white wine moms that have too many Starbucks, they treat these minorities like animals, like they're their pets to be taken care of, like a project. soft bigotry like, of low expectations. Yeah, dude, I always, uh, you know, all my comedian friends who are black, I always ask them if they hate liberal white women the most. Because Malcolm X they, did. They always, they're always like, like if they post something, you know, I don't know, on on Facebook, and you know, it's a racial thing. Then all the white liberal women are in the comments, like defending, like they need, uh, like the black people need the white liberal women to defend them and to protect yeah. them or whatever. Yeah, and, and it drives. They're always the first to bring up race. Nuts. Yeah, they're always the first to bring up race, and then. I also like the it's like Michael Scott from The Office for people who have watched The Office, where it's this mindset of thinking like every black person you meet has been in a gang. Like I've I've worked I've had bosses like that where when they would hire someone who was black, you could tell that they really thought that they just like, you know, made world peace by giving this guy a job. And it's like, dude, he's just like he came from the same community as us. Like uh, he's we're good. <laughs> yeah, it's it's hilarious because. It reminds me of the Dave Chappelle skit. I think it's Dave Chappelle one where it's this this black kid who's who's acting like he's white or whatever, and he's like, "I'm a systems engineer for Coca Cola." That's 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 what it kind of reminds me of when um, you know, they they act like every black is an ex con that just got out of a gang and they're they're saving their life by giving him a second chance, and then you learn uh, this guy's a doctor. 
<laughs> you're just it it just doesn't really it's kind of misguided and it's yeah it's a little bit sad in its own way but this is what we do and this is the guys that we do by we i, I don't mean us besides maybe bechtel but yes. other than that like we do this under the guise of of spreading democracy and freedom and our ideas but again the main point i'm saying is if your ideas are so great you don't have to spread them with force so take chile just to get it to the actual thing that we're talking about yeah chile is a socialist country democratic socialist leader his name was ayande so that's um, Ayande, the CIA colludes with a company called ITT to stop his election and they fail because the people wanted him to be the leader. And when he was elected the leader, this will ring very nostalgic to you guys. When he was elected against the CIA's, you know, election interference, they said they will make sure he doesn't last six months. So Ayande wanted to nationalize some of the lucrative resources like mining. That's what all these people do. And that's what they want to do in the Middle East. They have a lot of money. They're sitting on a lot of money, just like they're sitting on a lot of oil. They're sitting on, um, this one was a mine. So at the time, 20% of the U.S. foreign investments are in Latin America. And again, this is that tricky dick. This is tricky dick and his boy Kissinger. He said his quote was to make Chile scream. Ugh. What you know, and I, that's not a playful, you know. Is sick. that the did Kissinger say that or the tricky dick? That's what tricky dick did. You know, Kissinger, oh, I wouldn't make up scream. Uh, Kissinger, exactly. He he yeah. that was his next trick. So what does that mean? Well, that's the same thing that they impeached Trump over, right? Make him scream means to withhold government aid. It means to threaten him with economic collapse. Multinational banks and other huge companies start visiting and telling them that they're not going to give them any loans. As essentially, they're going to stop the flow of dollars into the country if they don't do what they say. So what is making sure, that's just on the financial perspective. What does let's make sure he doesn't last six months mean? Well, that means that our our boy, the goblin slash demon who is turned 100, Henry Kissinger, <coughs> is responsible for more Cambodian deaths than Hiroshima and Nagasaki combined, he comes in and um, we have a corporate sponsored gorilla named Pinochet. So Pinochet controls the military and the police. And that's our guy. That's who we're sponsoring. And by we, I mean the companies and perhaps maybe even Bechtel. And me. Yeah, but this yeah. Pinochet guy, Ayande is governing and he's liked by the people. He, he launches 24 rockets into the presidential palace, killing him. And gathering tens of thousands of his supporters, mainly, you know, activist leaders. It's almost like Tiananmen Square, but he gathered the Ayande supporters, Pinochet did, and put them in a local football stadium where they could just perform executions and torture them like they were trained to do by the CIA. So anyway, Pinochet, of course, doesn't know how to run a government. He controls the military and he controls the the police force, but he needs people to run the government. Well, what do you know? There was a, a foreign exchange program where a bunch of Chilean students went to the University of Chicago and studied under Milton Freeman and knew exactly <laughs> how unfettered capitalism builds an economy up from nothing. And we need to get ever a after. realistic communistic thing. So he comes in, he appoints the, they even called him the Chicago boys. So this is, again, what I'm saying. They had a nickname? Yes, of course they had a nickname. And <laughs> when, they, had when, nickname. when they did this in Russia with Yeltsin, uh, they even called them the Chicago Boys. So these are economic technicians, economic technicians. And um, so it's a free game. They turn their country into the the capitalistic dream, which means they slash all government spending. They privatize all the national businesses or functions uh, like mining or like these, these industries that they have that were funding the national, the, the, the whole nation. And so they get a 400% inflation record number of unemployment, kind of like what we got during the COVID where every, everyone's closing, they're making a killing. Everyone else is suffering. But 
when it didn't work and Pinochet was grilled on it, his economic leaders or whatever they're called, the Chicago boys, they said, it's not the market's fault. We just need to do more, right? You know that quote. They were still yeah. using them, by the way. We just need to do more. We hear that a lot today. And so the economy contracted, inflation soared, local businesses closed, state-owned businesses were privatized, and the economy crashed. Now, remember, buying up all these assets, a lot of people just don't care about this shit or... And I don't blame them because it's annoying and it's, it's not really our job. You know, like I play music and Austin, you do comedy. Bechtel, the jury's still out on the company, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, we don't really care about this stuff. Right. But the, the country's being bought up by private companies and I'll loop it around to something domestic, you know, um, with our money, the, this country is being bought up with our money and loans. And even if it's not with our money, when these corporations go belly up, they're bailed out with our money. So either way you cut it, it's ours because government subsidies are our money. Just, you know, when the banks fail, Silicon Valley Bank most recently, and another couple other banks, the money was printed over the weekend and, and handed them to you. And we're on the we're on the dole for that. So in 2008, it was the same. When Whenever some type of collapse happens. Everyone acts so surprised. But as I just described in Chile, these same companies, this is JP Morgan, you know, Citibank and Citigroup and all these companies, they were behind this Chilean operation. In the, when this happens here, everyone acts so surprised like it was a big thing. they they done they had done it a dozen times before 2008 this was just the move they pulled at home today and chile's uh collapsed it was hor it took about 10 or 12 years to get out of the hole that it fell into which any conservative would just say today that that was market correction but um today even the liberal New York Times or, or Wall Street Journal say that Pinochet was a man that transformed Chile's turnaround, but it, it he wasn't. All he did was lead him into a depression and a collapse. And then this, uh, the only state-owned company that actually never privatized, which I think was a mine, pulled them out of their out of their thing. And so the citizens suffered, and um, just like a economic crisis usually happens and the, the rich get richer and those on the inside without regulation and they get bailouts and they play with other people's money and there's a huge wealth transfer just like we seen a couple of years ago creates oligarchs and then they went on to brazil they did it in argentina and uruguay and to mexico um the point is, it made me think of something funny while I was talking. You, did you know about the recent scandal with the Bud Light endorsing the trans spokesperson? Yes. So yeah, yeah, everyone heard about this. Bud Light's yeah. endorsing the trans. We got the trans um, doing March as if it's not comical in itself, right? We got this trans person drinking Bud Light to, to do a sponsorship for March Madness, right? Three things that don't. <laughs> that don't go together at all. Uh, no, they don't make any sense. And they're all mad. They're up in arms, you know, the whatever it might be. But companies have always done this. They've always chosen sides. There is a lot of weird stuff going on with, you know, the DEI and the ESG. But just setting that aside, just to go to an example that kind of is relevant to me at home, Flint, GM, whatever. You know, GM devastated our economy, sent jobs overseas where they could employ slaves and where there would be no trade unions or regulations. Or if the people did make a fuss, the corporate sponsored military would just kidnap and kill them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. These corporations, they act like their own their own state, their own independent state or their own government or country. Yeah. It's because a lot of them actually are, you know, let me just on a. A little side note, a lot of these companies, these big companies are actually screaming about privatization and, and the great 
ness of industry capitalism, they have a GDP larger than some countries and just basically only on government contracts and they're positioning themselves to be the next authoritative government on the matter. Like the military outsources the majority of their operations to private companies, our U.S. military. So for example, Israel handles most of our cyber securities, although we have a Pentagon. So again, you don't have to be conservative or, or liberal to be pissed because you're paying twice. We're, we're paying for you know, a subcontractor or a military contractor to handle our cyber securities, and we're definitely paying for the Pentagon to also yeah. do the same thing. So we're getting robbed twice. But back to the, the, the Bud Light trans issue or whatever it might be called, this is a little bit more of a serious one. Um, in Argentina, they called the Ford Falcon the death mobile. Because every time a Ford Falcon was on the scene, someone was killed or kidnapped. And you're like, oh, they must have loved Ford Falcons. No. Once again, GM took their plants where they could have no regulations, where they could employ slaves, where they could pay people less, where there could be no trade unions, where there could be no activists. They stored tanks at Ford plants for intimidation purposes. And they took activists and union members who wanted to break who wanted like hour lunches or wanted to go on a break, they tortured them. So when you're up in arms about the trans with the, with the Bud Light, just remember in Argentina, they called the Ford Falcon a death mobile. These are, so that's, that's corporate sponsored execution. Mercedes did the same thing. So did Chrysler. So did Fiat. Fiat actually um, got about six of their activist leaders executed all at once. This is a car company, by the way, just in case you forgot, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It David, you. I do have access to a Ford Falcon, by the way. So if I, I'll just say yeah, this yeah. tread lightly when you keep mentioning the name Bechtel with me, otherwise you might see. Yeah. Me now he has a Ford Falcon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did you, you guys got, you don't even know what I got access to. You better chill out with the Bechtel stuff. Otherwise you're going to have a Falcon rolling up. Yeah. The death mobile will show up. But yeah, it's, yes. So the car yeah. companies are just murdering people. I've never that heard that before. Lunch breaks. Yeah, keep going. That's crazy. Yeah, that's that's old news. And um, you know, once once you kind of get hip to this again, it's not just to be a downer. It's kind of just to be like, you know, look at what's going on, man. Yeah. You know, it got to the point over there where they were killing high school kids because they asked for lower bus fare. Damn. And their logic behind killing high school kids was they were infected with the Marxist virus and they must eradicate it. And what that did oh. was strike fear into everyone so they wouldn't assemble or come together and everyone stayed divided. And that's kind of yeah. what the point I was getting to that that we were we kind of keep circling, circling around is these are the ruts they get us in talking about socialism, and capitalism, and capitalism and capitalism and all this other <laughs> stuff. Right. But we and we stay in these ruts for decades while they make a lot of money behind the scenes. And then we act like, you know, we did something when they decide to finally be like, all right, we made enough here. It it wasn't like, you know, to a certain extent, you can't just keep making that money because the people aren't they're not going to put up with it. That's why we pulled out of Iraq, you know? Yeah. But, but that's like every corporation, you know, the, they, um, they mark up everything an insane percentage. And then the goal is that a corporation can never lose money. So then they have to top the year before Man. the year before, even though they use COVID as a way to increase profits, but now they can't dip below those profits they made during a crisis. Yeah. I mean, I, I think this is why you, you have to have a, a healthy fear and skepticism of government. Right. And that's not just a socialist or communist government, but capitalists too. You know, I, I still take capitalists over the other two, you know, all things considered. And even with corporations, um, same thing there, you know, I, I, what's nice about, um, companies, um, like in America is that they can, when they, when they do something that you don't agree with, they feel the pain a lot quicker than a government necessarily. Right. Because we don't buy their products. Now, sometimes it, it, uh, sometimes the market doesn't do that. Sometimes it does. We've seen a variety of, we've did even uh, BlackRock was taking a hit because people are getting tired of the ESG stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. So, which is, which is shocking. So it's like, all things considered, I'll take it, but it is good to know these things. And it is good to realize that 
after a certain point, like David said, this is, this isn't, when you think of a business or a government where this isn't your city council and this isn't your local t-shirt shop, this is like a, a higher level than, you know, we could even ever imagine being in, you know, <clears throat> it is. And you should, you should kind of be aware of, of what's happening to just be able to think a bit better because it's, again, it sounds conspiratorial, but narratives are being written and they aren't necessarily always true. So for example, it just like you said, people started to notice and condemn Milton Friedman because of this. We noticed a bunch of things going on and he couldn't show up places or give his speeches without being interrupted. And he was compared uh, as Chile under Pinochet to Germany under the Nazis and Friedman's collaboration with him was compared with the technocrats collaboration with the third Reich. And do you know what Friedman called his critics? This is, uh, this is just to give you a great um, hmm. feeling of comfort that, you know, nothing's changed in 50 years. He called them Nazis. Yeah. So and what's even crazier, this is a, the thing about rewriting history that we should be also aware of. He got a Nobel Prize in economics for his great work. Oh, yeah, of course he did. I mean, that um, makes actually perfect sense. Remember when they gave Obama one right before he bombed the hell out of the Middle East? Yeah, he, he needed that for the, his great work in drone strikes, dude. He, he really advanced, yeah. you know, the striking of a drone. A they gave Obama a peace prize for, you know, bombing more drone, doing more. Yeah, drone. but guys, it's because now we can bomb someone on their porch and not hit the surrounding areas. I mean, we, we've our drone technology has really gone a long way. So, yeah, well, it gets even better than that. So he gets a Nobel Economics Prize for his great work, although his great work just was, you know, countless killings and tortured and a country's collapse. But he, the kicker is. Later, a, a, the next year, a company was giving the Nobel Peace Prize, forget the name of the company, for exposing the human rights violations that were happening in Chile and Argentina. So the same company, Nobel Economics Prize for the great work of you know killing, torturing, country collapse, of that great economical work done the next year. The same company, Nobel Peace Prize, gives to a company that exposed the violations that happened in Chile and Argentina. So awards are given on both sides who was independently instrumental. You you yeah. almost can't make it up. Yeah. It's, it, it, uh, it reminds me of it kind of madness. reminds me of the uh, the Orwellian idea of the double the double double speak. Double speak or double think. I think it's both. <laughs> Really? Yeah. yeah. I always, I always think about that when people talk about um, Americans do it a lot, but even people outside of America that where they criticize America for not having free health care. Mm -hmm. um, I, I thought this was especially funny, you know, 10 years or whatever ago when they would praise Obama for his great contribution to the country called Obamacare and criticize America for not having health care. Yeah. Because it almost makes your mind hurt. <laughs> yeah. Because you, you, you have to wonder what's Obamacare if not health care for the poor, which we already know what it was, you know, it was an expansion of Medicaid or Medicaid, uh, Medicaid yeah. which were two programs that we already had with health care for the poor. <laughs> and now I'm not defending those at all or sticking up for them at all. They're shitty. I have had those my whole life, but, I thought it was funny to criticize America for not having health care while praising Obama for have creating free health care for the poor. And this is <laughs> the double think and the double speak. And no yeah. one, I, I never heard anyone bring these points up. I've, I've never heard anyone say, you know, those couldn't be more opposite of the ideas. And what's funny was the free health care, the big air quotes around that, which was, Obamacare, which was just an expansion of Medicaid. Yeah. It just allowed pharmaceutical companies to, to charge whatever they wanted for the medication, which was the only way that they would allow Obama to have his shitty insurance 
And he didn't care about us or the insurance. He just wanted to run to the American people and get praises for his complex pyramid scheme that was Obamacare. It, yeah, and have it, it named it, after him. Right. You know. It's like we have Medicaid and Obamacare. What can we do? We can get him to accept some more medications and then rebrand it as Obamacare. And then the pharmaceutical company said, well, no, we're not doing that because we make way too much money. If you want to sign this you know, form that says we can charge whatever we want for medicines, and then we're okay with giving you your, your fake insurance that already existed that your country thinks they don't have. And <laughs> it, was, it was just all these ideas being held. And again, whether side you're on, you should kind of be upset about yeah well think what about this uh what about this logic um you know greta thunberg uh criticizes germany and all of these governments and so uh she makes a speech crying saying that you know she's not going to get a grow up because of global warming so then germany instead of they they get rid of their regulations for oil and drilling and stuff and they just outsource it to china and russia who have no regulations they they don't care about pollution they don't care about any of that so now germany just buys oil from these other countries and they've actually made the climate worse because instead of doing it in house and and maybe doing it the right way they're just saying well yeah we stopped drilling by this much well yeah but we still need oil so you dunces are just buying it from countries that don't have these you know regulations in place so you've just made it worse same same stupid logic yeah, you don't know if it's intentional or not, um, uh, because we know that closing down these these nuclear factories and and all this stuff um, that's a backwards move. And these other countries that they're outsourcing to are building not only nuclear energy factories, but even coal factories. Still, China's still building multiple coal factories. I think dozens a year. And they're yeah. putting they're putting the foot on the gas while we're putting the foot on the brake. And I don't think that's gonna be a recipe for success. No, that's they true. can't even recently when I was in California down in Newport Beach, they have uh, in Bal Balboa Island and Peninsula, like a boat that you can take from one side to the other with your yeah. car. And whatever Newsom's like, all right, everything has to go electric. Well, that boat, that ferry that carried them across, that probably won't even exist anymore because in order to make the boat electric, it would be so heavy that it wouldn't float. Gee, I didn't know that. Yeah, for the amount of battery that would be on <laughs> it. So like all these people are pissed down there because, you know, it's they got like the Ferris wheel down there. It's, you know, your typical. Yeah. And that uh, guy's trying to fill up. He's he's uh, circling yeah. the presidential stuff. So how do we so I want to hit an off ramp here and, and David, go over anything that, that you want to say if you've missed it or whatever. But really, the point of this stuff is I would rather see people be um, skeptical of government and, and big business and, and the media. Um, rather than embrace it all or, or fall in line and believe everything, especially with the scientific thing. That, that was a big point. I, I, I believe, weren't there ads back in the day in the tobacco industry that like nine out of 10 doctors preferred, you know, this brand of cigarettes? Like that, that used to be the kind of stuff they said. And when you were talking about the scientists, I was like sitting here just, it was like sending chills as I was like putting all this together about how long this has been going on. And it's right. so spooky. And so... I, and well, I mean, like it can all be summed up, you know, like the hearing all this stuff. What's the main point of it all is um, to quote Michael Jackson. They don't really care about us. Yeah. Like you think these companies and corporations and everything care about you, but it's always the dollar. Yeah. It's always on, like you said, to the next grift, the next con. Yeah. That's the main takeaway, in my opinion, is don't get suckered into thinking, you know, Nike or Bud Light or a car company cares about your well-being. They yeah, they don't. It's crazy to th or to think that they care about climate change, you know, or Ukrainians, or <laughs> anything, you know. Yeah, they didn't. 
there's an old entrepreneurial saying. I don't know if you've heard it, but it's a super corny meme that was kind of going around with all the, I don't know what they were called, but, you know, in the self-improvement field about, which I try to stay away from, which is pretty obvious. I could probably use it and need some self-improvement. The only problem- I was going to say, you try to stay away from self-improvement. <laughs> yes. Yes. The, the industry, the industry. <laughs> <laughs> have a, they had an old saying uh if a if a human be a, behaved like a, a company you'd, you would be a psychopath or a sociopath right uh-huh. i don't know if you've ever heard that but it's it's basically it's obvious you know they create these corporations and then they be, almost become like egregores or little straw men basically to do, do anything and escape i always i always have a real suspicion about the naive approach that a lot of people take where they just sit down and flat out say you know i don't think any of these people are evil but um you know it's just you know they got a family to feed and it's like if you have 70 billion dollars the family's fed just stop just that the idea that they act with impunity it doesn't matter if they're evil or not they don't have consequences when they break the law. They don't go to jail like we do when they do fraudulent things or, or leave whatever. cocaine at the white house. Yeah. No one gets prosecuted. No one does jail time. Their fines are a fraction of their thing. And you, and you can't talk about it because I think I talked about this in the black metal episode where I was talking about Satan and God and, you know, uh, the, the black metal people where, you know, Satan being a Christian construct. And if you're so anti in the idea of being so anti something, you're able to be used by the opposition. So if we have a conversation um, where you, you criticize capitalism, you're a communist sympathizer. If you criticize socialism, you're a right winger. Or you criticize people making money hand over fist from the climate change. Then they say stuff like, oh yeah, he thinks climate change isn't real. You know, whenever anyone says something isn't real, you should stay far away from that person. Like during COVID, if you didn't want to wear a mask or get the shot, they would say he thinks COVID isn't real. And that's that's the low resolution that we're kept at. Again, having these 40-year, 20-year debates. So we never get anywhere and they can continue to rake in cash. That's the the tagline. Whenever you disagree with someone, and once again, you're just being used by the the opposition, they deduce it down to, he thinks whatever it is, insert whatever, isn't real. It, we've now got to the point where we're no longer able to discuss anything. We now either think things are real or not. Yeah. That's, that's a good way. Yeah. That's a good way um, so Kissinger's been going goblin mode for like 50, 60 years. Um, is there any way, David, that on a Yeva track, we can have a Kissinger mode? Maybe you can kick us a Kissinger mode song. Yeah, I think, I think I'm going to have to think about that. That's a good idea. Have you seen him recently? If you look at some of these people and, and you're thinking, <laughs> I don't think he's a very bad guy. That's a goblin. Dude, I know. <laughs> <laughs> all i'm thinking about like when we got like these people that george soros kissinger that have lived forever are the goblin puppets from the labyrinth yeah if so, you go exactly did bowie in the so lab like we're so there's bowie. your if you write the kissinger mode song like you're the goblin prince and then you could have all these goblins that are like kissinger and everything dancing around yeah, yeah, if you look at the, just go watch uh, when tr- when Trump's sitting there with Kissinger. Uh, that was just the last time I remember kind of seeing him. And he's like, you know, we're talking about good ideas. We're talking about great ideas. We're gonna we're gonna do great. We're gonna do good. Look at Kissinger sitting there, sitting next to him like a blob. <laughs> and he's just a goblin demon waiting in the shadows. Just look, just just have a look. Like and- Nosferatu, just. Exactly. <laughs> just, or some of these people like like austin said if you take a look at them you look at soros you think that's not a lizard <laughs> yeah. you think that's he has to be a lizard. Under there you know what i mean he's 400 years old yeah yeah oh dude th- their it's eyes immortal. are so spooky it's it's always like the eyes uh 
with all these with all these world leaders that are that old when you look at it their yellow eyes it is i i get it dude i get why because they've killed three hundred thousand people a piece that's kind of that look that you get you know how <laughs> you know soldiers have oh, like that's that look. Hundreds yeah. of thousand yard stare and it's because they might have killed a few people yeah these people have killed hundreds of thousands i i already told you about my last joke when you know about yeah walks in the room but yeah, that's the that's the glare that you achieve. That's why Hillary Clinton looks like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, again, I think that what's good here is um, just to to think about stuff and, like David said, don't have a low resolution opinion where you just write something off. Think about it. Think about statistics. Even when you hear a statistic, break it down in your head. Okay, they say seventy uh, percent of people believe this. Well. Okay, well, let's break down where are these seventy percent of people at? You know, what is this? What is that? You know, think through these stats and and believing the science and the scientists. You know, do they have any kind of a personal uh, gain at, at it? You know, that that would do great. And again, you know, really not even trying to do a corny tie into art, but there's that I don't believe this where people say like artists save the world. I don't. I think that that's just super corny, but I think that artists sit around and talk about this stuff because if you're an artist, you're very observant and I, because you have to be observant. Some of the most creative, some of the most creative and best art comes from, you know, looking at these things and trying to break it down and, and tell a story, you know, 1984 animal farm by Orwell, you know, he was just, he was basically just telling the tale of what he saw happen, but you know, a lot of great work has come, uh, during the fall of an empire or criticisms of, of a government or whatever. So um, I think it would do us all well to keep that in mind. Uh, David, you're going overseas. Um, so we'll have a, we'll have a break in conversation. And when we come back, we've kind of made a decision that we're going to talk about lighter subjects. Yeah. And so uh, we'll, we'll work through what our next one is offline. It's not going to be anything depressing and hopefully this doesn't make you feel uh, helpless and hopeless in the world. Just think about things. Things can get better. The best is yet to come. This is tool shed art club. David, do you have anything you want to promote before we kick you off? I actually believe that the artist can save the world. So you call well, All right. Then wait, hold on. I'm and then, corny. I'm the corny. I'm the yeah. corny. And, uh, and you do too. In what way? In a, in a degree that artists can change the world. I, I didn't say, I didn't say change yeah. the world. I said save yeah. the world. Yes. Okay. So um, I believe that. Yeah. Well, cool. All right. That's all I got.